Let's move. And we're also going to go live on Facebook. Boom. not seem to be live on Facebook. Let me try it again. Okay, it might not be live. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody. This is our uh, our final webinar in our this year-long series that we have had. My name is Terry Eichel. I'm with the Interreligious Eco Justice Network. And I am very excited to have Lydia Pan here with us tonight to offer a webinar on how to remove, identify and remove invasive plants. The Interreligious Ecojustice Network is a long title for a faith-based environmental organization in Connecticut that works with religious communities on environmental issues like climate change, um, gardens, community gardens, toxic pollution, uh, transportation initiatives, climate justice. So, we have a lot of different issues that we work on. Our events are open to all, regardless of uh, your faith or no faith. You know, we welcome everybody, but we do specifically work with the religious community. And so we have been offering these webinars since um, the pandemic started. This is actually an outgrowth of our Green Forum uh, scenario, which was a 90 minute workshop that we would have with panelists on different topics. And so when the pandemic happened, we obviously switched online like everybody did. And so we've been doing that ever since. Um, hopefully in the fall, we are going to be able to um, have a, uh, a blend of webinars and live events. So we're hopeful. Lydia is an amazing person. You are in honestly for a treat. She is super knowledgeable. She is super dedicated and she is super nice. So she's just a really wonderful advocate for native plants and just knows so much. She has a PhD. She is actually a, form, a former pharmaceutical industrial industry professional who loves both nature and gardening. She has found a satisfying intersection of these interests in the conservation of native plant communities. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Yale and a PhD in Biological Sciences from the University of California, San Diego. After doing biomedical research in Palo Alto, California and New York City, she worked at Pfizer for more than 21 years, first in drug discovery for musculoskeletal diseases, then in science policy and public affairs. Upon retiring in 2014, Lydia joined Wild Ones and has served as a president of the Mountain Laurel chapter since 2019. She leads volunteers to help manage invasive plants and restore native plant communities at Coogan Farm and Mystic. Lydia is a volunteer docent at the Connecticut College Arboretum a member of the Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group and an alternate director on the board of the Eastern Connecticut Conservation District. So she is an extremely knowledgeable panelist. What I'm gonna have her do is she's going to give her presentation. If you have questions, put them in the chat or in the Q&A and we, after her presentation is finished, we'll go through the questions and get them answered. So. Thank you so much, Lydia, for being here. This is really wonderful and I'm excited to have you. Well, thank you, Terry. It's great to be here, you, and to have this opportunity. Let me see, there we go. Whoops, I, of course, I'm not at the beginning. Um, so let me start at the beginning and just say a few more words about Wild Ones, which is an organization that, as Terry mentioned, I discovered in 2014 upon my retirement. Uh, Wild Ones is a national not-for-profit uh, that is dedicated to promoting environmentally friendly landscaping, pro uh, landscaping practices to preserve biodiversity through preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. It was founded in 1977, or at least the, the seed of the idea of the organization came about um, when nine uh, environmental activists who attended a natural landscaping workshop in Wisconsin bonded over the idea of landscaping with native plants as 
an important part of the solution to a lot of the major environmental problems that were coming to the forefront at that time. Um, so the organization was incorporated in 1990 and then granted 501c3 tax exempt status in 1995. Um, so Wild One serves as a resource for individuals and communities as they move toward ethical choices in land use and in the redefinition of our current guidelines and ordinances affecting landscaping. Because we are a plants root organization, our mission is carried out by over 60 local chapters across the country. The Mountain Laurel chapter is sponsored by Connecticut College Arboretum. We provide mentorship and resources for those interested in learning to garden ecologically using native plants through educational programming, volunteer opportunities, and our human community of native plant enthusiasts. Most of our programs, field trips, and other activities are free and open to the public. So I'd like to start by just getting us all on the same page as to what is an invasive plant. There is a legal definition and it is based on the scientific um, definition and, and characterization. So invasive plants are non-native plants that are disruptive in ways that cause environmental or economic harm or harm to human health. Not all non-native species are invasive. And if, but if they are not managed, these particular invasive species crowd out native plants. They alter ecosystems by changing the way the plants, soil, animals, and water interact, often causing harm to other species in addition to the plants that have been crowded out. So there's a kind of domino effect and ultimately the degradation they cause to ecosystems can um, reduce biodiversity, cause local extinctions, and detrimentally affect the health of our ecosystems. So of 2,800 vascular plant species that are found in Connecticut, about 1,000 are non-native, and of these 1,000 non-natives, about 98 are regarded, well, 98 are listed on our Connecticut State Invasive Plant List. So how does a species become invasive? Um, invasive plants are able to, uh, to um, establish new plants to propagate themselves and grow rapidly under a wide range of site conditions. In other words, they're very adaptable. They have a high reproductive rate. They can disperse themselves wide distances, often by the spreading of vegetative fragments as well as seeds. And because they are non-native, they, the they tend to lack natural controls or predators on their growth and reproduction that would normally keep them in check where they are native. So implicitly the definition of invasive, you know, it has a location um, component. So you have to be outside of your native environment to be invasive. So as I mentioned, Connecticut maintains an invasive plant species list. And this is done by the Connecticut Invasive Plants Council, which is a body that is appointed by the state government agencies, legislative bodies, educational institutions, nonprofits, and other stakeholder groups. It was created in 2003 to carry out the Connecticut State Invasive Plant Laws. These are in the general statutes under section 22A, also 15-180, and a couple of public acts. Um, the listed species are not automatically prohibited. Lobbying by the nursery industry has permitted exceptions, which I will talk about, um, because they think that they have bred specific cultivars which are not invasive. But this has created areas of controversy, and you can form your own opinions about the um, pros and cons of this. But I just wanted to point that out, that being listed does not mean um, that nurseries are prohibited from selling or that, um, you know, that the invasive species have to be removed. Um, as I mentioned, the current list uh, is comprised of 98 species, and the laws include a process for public input and listing as invasive or potentially invasive. The Invasive Plants Council may recommend how to discourage import and sale and identify identify alternatives to the listed species, which it recommends to the public. But as I mentioned, it does not necessarily have the power to prohibit. That's a separate um, argument that has to be made. So the, um, 
uh, Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group is a very valuable um, group that it's an ad hoc consortium that was formed in 1997 with a mission to gather and convey information on the presence, distribution, and impacts of invasive species and also to uh, monitor their and recommend management activities. Also to promote the uses of native or non-invasive ornamental alternatives throughout Connecticut. And it collaborates with researchers, conservation organizations, government and green industries and the general public to identify and manage invasive species proactively and as effectively as possible. So I said, it's a multi-stakeholder consortium, including federal, state, and town agency staff, researchers, nursery growers, educators, master gardeners, community members, and any interested citizens. The current co-chairs are Rose Hiskus from the uh, Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station and Emmett Varecchio, Vicki Wallace from the Yukon Extension. And they meet uh, the and they chair a committee that meets one to two times a year to collaborate and share information on the research and issues that are uh, currently uh, most critical uh, regarding native uh, regarding invasive plants. They also organize a biannual symposium, which is a great public for, uh, forum to educate the public um, about invasive species. Um, and they maintain this wonderful website as the screenshot of which is shown here. Um, and it is https uh, slash backslash backslash sipwig.yukon.edu. It's a terrific information resource. And it is, I will confess that it is one of the major resources I've used in putting together my presentation tonight. And it contains a number of resources that are all publicly available and some of which I've highlighted on a reference list that I'm providing Terry. So, um, what Terry asked me to do is to help teach you all how to identify and uh, control to remove the top 10 invasive species of concern in Connecticut. Uh, so these, this is a top 10 list statewide. So in your particular region, there may be other species that um, you have been made aware of. And as I said, there are 98 species total on the list. So this isn't everybody, but these are ones that are very common and a number that I've had personal experience with um, seeing them um, multiply um, in local areas. And in some cases I've had some hands-on experience uh, working to remove them. So for each, I'm going to talk briefly about their history and the harm they do, how to identify them, how they spread, and then how we can try to control them. Number one on the list is Japanese knotweed, Polygonum cuspidatum. So this was a plant that was introduced first as an ornamental in the late 1800s. It, is, it was widely used and then escaped and is now widespread in our environment, not only in the US, but also throughout Europe. Um, it was first used in the UK and there it is in fact, um, it's, it's actually a consideration when um, individuals try to sell their home properties. Um, the value, they're actually not allowed to, to sell a property that has Japanese knotweed um, present because it is so damaging. It can, um, it can come through the pavement, it can grow through pavement and building foundations. It impairs riparian habitats. Um, not providing adequate erosion control to the banks. And the fact that it crowds out all the other plants um, decreases the ecological value um, of an otherwise very important native habitat. It's a member of the buckwheat family. Um, the, the actual scientific name um, has been recently changed to Fallopia japonica, just in case you ever see that um, written. Um, it flowers in the late summer and produces tons of seeds. Here you see on the left, a picture of the dormant, uh, dormant stand of, um, of, of knotweed in the winter time. You can see the stems are still standing and the many um, seeds up in the top here. It's a very, it has very bamboo-like canes that are hollow and have these swollen nodes. The leaves are heart-shaped and on these reddish stems, and you can see how the flowers are produced in between each sets of leaves. 
um, Japanese knotweed in early spring can look have either reddish or greenish leaves and it looks like this as it emerges from the ground and I like to show seedling pictures because seedlings and are the best plants to remove. You can pull them out completely and, and then you've removed the entire plant. Uh, mature knotweed stands are not amenable to easy removal. They have extensive rhizomatous root systems that are very hard to dig out. And if you leave fragments, those fragments will re-sprout. So in fact, the best control techniques that are recommended if you do not want to use chemicals are to cut them. They're in fact a group of um, avid conservationists in Niantic who have over the past decade perfected a um, technique of cutting three times during the season. And if you persist at doing this over a period of two to three years, you can weak weaken the knotweed to the point where you can plant other natives or other desired um, plantings and they will prosper. And with minimal uh, monitoring to continue uh, keeping the knotweed in check, um, this area can be managed and largely maintained as a um, natural, as a as a valuable, healthy um, environmental site. So I also show you these pictures. So young knotweed looks like the little uh, plants on the left. Mature knotweed, when it pushes out new shoots in the spring, looks kind of like asparagus. And like asparagus, these shoots are actually edible. So if you know the knotweed has not been, is, is not in an area where it um, has been uh, treated with toxins um, or chemicals, you can actually harvest and eat these, uh, cook them and eat them. Um, and that's another way of um, enjoying the knotweed while exert, doing some control. As, they, as Russ Cohen says, if you can't beat them, eat them. Number two on our list is oriental bittersweet. Um, another plant that probably many of you are familiar because it is so common. Bittersweet was intro also introduced as an ornamental. Um, it's a very aggressive vine which uh, you can see what the leaves look like on the left. They're glossy, sort of rounder oval with um, fine toothing on the edges. Um, you often see these, uh, not, uh, these uh, bittersweet vines cutting into the trunks of other saplings and other trees as it winds its way up them. And in fact, sorry about that, it can even um, strangle them. And if it doesn't do that, it can um, shield the leaves of the tree from sunlight and block their photosynthesis. And in that way also um, weaken the uh, plants it's climbing on. And in some cases, the weight of the knotweed vines can get so heavy that they actually bring down uh, the trees that they've climbed on. On the right, you see the very ornamental berries of the bittersweet, and um, it is fine to collect these and use them in crafts and for decorations as long as you dispose of them properly, um, which means putting them in the trash if your trash is incinerated or um, otherwise disposed of in a secure landfill, you do not want to put them in your compost because it is largely by seed that this plant spreads. The birds will eat, eat the berries and then disperse the seeds as they fly off and um, poop them out. So it turns out we do have a native bittersweet, Celestris americanus, which looks very similar in many ways to the invasive Asiatic bittersweet. And here this little cartoon shows you there are a couple of, and while I, I must say that I have never seen the native, it is relatively uncommon, but you know, should you, uh, be trying to control invasives perhaps in a um, land preserve or place that is relatively pristine and is only experiencing an early stage of invasion, it is worth knowing in case there might be the native present. So the native looks a little different in two ways. It only produces flowers and fruit at the very ends of its vines. And then if you look closely at the mature fruits, these little um, decorative uh, walls or bracts around the round berry are orange instead of yellow. So those are the two ways you can distinguish them. And unfortunately, when invasive plants have native relatives, that's one of the uh, frequent environmental um, 
sequ uh, consequences is that they will crowd out and displace the native, which is usually growing in a much more restrained manner because it has its natural checks and balances, whereas the invasive does not. Number three is Japanese barberry. And this is something I see too often still in people's yards and gardens. And in fact, its sale is not yet prohibited in Connecticut because there are new cultivars that the plantsmen claim are sterile and safe to plant. And while this is uh, maybe disputed and is, uh, it's still unclear whether that is actually the case, um, there's still a lot of barberry around and the barberry that has already escaped to, into our environment is the ones that we really need to um, focus on. Although if you can convince your neighbors not to plant barberries, that's also a win. So um, most of you probably do know what native, uh, what Japanese barberry looks like. It comes in both green and purple cultivars um, and the seedlings will show the coloration of the parent that they came from. The seedlings also show a, a, an identifying feature that I don't have a picture of here otherwise, which is if you cut a barberry uh, stem or root, the wood inside is very yellow. And you can see that yellowish coloration already even on this tiny little seedling. The plants flower quite early in the spring. In fact, that's another um, characteristic that a lot of invasives have is they were some of the first plants to green up in the springtime and they get growing and um, flowering and fruiting quite early on ahead of our native plants. So you see these are the typical flowers and the red pairs of berries that are produced. And here's an example of a barberry thicket thicket that is growing at the edge of a woodland. And um, that's where barberries are causing the most harm in our woodlands. It is um, by displacing the native understory and also that they degrade the quality of the habitat in the forest. They are also um, promoters of Lyme disease. The deer in fact don't eat barberry, they prefer the native plants. But what the barberry um, what animals do like barberry are the deer mice, which are um, carriers of the Lyme disease pathogen. And so they find protection and um, proliferate in great numbers where there are barberry thickets. And in studies have actually shown that the incidence of um, Lyme carrying ticks and the numbers of ticks are much higher in barberry infested woodlands than in more pristine native woodlands. So there are many reasons that we want to get that barberry out of our environment. And the ways one can do that is, first of all, don't buy the plant, don't buy or plant them. And as I said, try to discourage your friends and neighbors from doing so, um, perhaps even replacing their barberries with a nice native alternatives like um, highbush blueberry or um, choke cherry. Um, there are many other natives that will give you a nice red fall color and a nice um, screening shrub without the um, invasive prop properties and problems. Um, you can pull small barberry seedlings. You can dig out large roots, being careful of the spines um, using tools like um, weed wrenches, um, or you can cut the plants as close to um, the ground as possible and um, paint the stems with an herbicide like glyphosate late in the season. Um, that is a very targeted and cautious use of the herbicide and that type of um, use can really help in controlling um, established invasions. Number four on our list is the multiflora rose, yet another ornamental that was introduced from Asia as a rootstock for grafting the ornamental roses that so many of us prize in our gardens. It was also planted in the early 1930s for erosion control, as crash barriers on embankments and highway mediums, and as a living fence to contain li livestock on farms. It can be distinguished from our native roses by its loose clusters of white flowers. Most of the native roses have actually pink flowers. Another invasive, Rosa rugosa, does also have pink flowers. But there is a feature at the base of the leaf on, on the multiflora rose, this fringed stipule, which you see enlarged up here. 
um, that is unique to this species. And so that's a really definitive identifier. Um, barberry plants, when they are not in fruit, um, look somewhat like uh, raspberries or blackberries, but um, can be distinguished again either by the stems because they are smooth and olive green except for the larger thorns, whereas um, raspberries, depending on the species, they can have rather hairy or dark grooved or um, ridged stems. Um, and then when the fruits farm, they're clearly, they look like rose hips. They are rose hips. And these are um, eaten by birds and uh, small mammals and uh, spread in that manner. The multiflora rose can, vines can also uh, reroot if they kind of arch over and touch the ground. So if you are cutting them um, or working to remove them, you have to be careful not to leave the piece, green pieces lying around on moist soil because there is the potential that they will reroot. Um, as mentioned, you can pull or dig isolated plants to control them. Um, large infestations can be uh, mowed um, in fields or cut frequently, meaning three to six times a season for uh, several years in a row. Um, if you have just a few uh, multiflora rose plants in an otherwise uh, good habitat or a good plant community, it may actually be preferable to cut them rather than try to pull them because pulling or digging sometimes disturbs the soil and raises a seed bank. And if there's a seed bank of more weed seeds, you could ultimately be causing more harm than good. A large plant, a large multiflora rose can produce a million seeds, which are viable for up to 20 years in the soil. Next, and the list is one of my, um, I don't know whether to call it a favorite or my most uh, kind of en uh, biggest enemies that I've been working against, it's mugwort. So this is a plant that in the last five or so years, I've seen increase dramatically here in southeastern Connecticut where I live. It is um, a plant that is native to Europe and Asia with a long history of use as a medicinal herb. And it was thought to have been introduced uh, by European colonists deliberately for that purpose, but also other times as contaminants in ship ballast and nursery stock. It's uh, most problematic in the northeast part of the North America. Um, and has only recently, as I mentioned, become very abundant in Connecticut. In fact, the listing as an invasive um, only occurred a few years ago after it was documented that mugwort was in fact reproducing by seed in our state. Uh, before that, it was only recognized as propagating itself vegetatively, which it also does very enthusiastically. So here you see that it, the leaves and foliage look very much like a chrysanthemum with this sort of multi-lobed. And as the plant grows, the leaves on different parts of the plant can have slightly different shapes. But what is very diagnostic in my mind is the fact that the underside of the leaf is um, downy and uh, silvery or white with these little short hairs. And also if you crush the leaves, they have a very distinctive aroma. It's actually not unpleasant and um, gives the plant, uh, those are the, some of the chemicals that are thought to give the plant some of its insecticidal qualities. So as that would imply, very little to nothing in terms of insect herbivores eat mugwort. In fact, mo most wild animals will avoid it as well. Livestock can be convinced to graze on it, sheep and goats to a limited extent um, with that they can do that without um, getting sick, but it's, really a plant with very little value to any kind of wildlife. You can see here that it has these even um, small plants on the surface can be growing from a long rhizomatous root. This is the way it sprouts and spreads. And it's another of those where if you do not do a good job of removing the entire plant, even small fragments as, as short as an inch or two can re-sprout into brand new plants. So mugwort grows vigorously and can attain heights of five to six feet during the course of a season. Um, it uh, shades out, it crowds out and shades out neighbor, neighboring plants. Um, its roots produce chemicals that are 
uh, known as allelopathic, meaning they suppress the germination of other types of plants. And so this is the way that mugwort will, um, within a short period of time, uh, spread over an area and form a mono monoculture. It flowers late in the summer and it looks, it's fl in flowering, it looks like one of its close relatives, um, ragweed. Whoops, sorry about that. And um, the flowers uh, are nectarless. They are wind pollinated and that wind borne pollen can also like ragweed pollen cause hay fever and allergies. And um, after pollination, the plants can form hundreds and thousands of seed, which um, mature relatively late in the year. So that's the good and bad news. One can control mugwort by cutting and mowing as late as um, August or early September. Um, the seeds are not, um, will not ripen um, if the plant is cut before they mature. But control is very difficult. As I mentioned, it's rarely browsed by native herbivores and um, it spreads to lar form large colonies. Um, it can be, um, it can spread both by um, the spread of fragments. So especially if soil is tilled, such as on agricultural lands, um, the fragments can be spread and then they, they can both um, root fragments and seed can be carried on um, um, tire treads and tractor treads. Um, to distant sites to start new populations. Um, control can be affected by repeated mowing, but this takes a lot of labor. It's very labor intensive. It has to be done. If you're doing this, if it's in a lawn or an area that's mowed frequently, that's probably the, the best thing to do is to keep mowing it. And it will not eliminate the mugwort, but will keep it weak and should prevent it from taking over. Um, in a garden setting, you can dig out uh, entire plants. This is best done in early spring or late fall. Um, and they are fairly shallow rooted. So if you use a spade to get under the entire plant, you can carefully lift out all of the roots. But in, in extensive infestations, really the only way to control it, um, and I'll talk later, is um, by a combination of methods. Um, Again, triaging can be simply mowing late in the season or once in June and once in the late summer, early fall to prevent seed set uh, and that can limit its spread. Um, but um, to really get rid of it requires either a combination of methods or as I'll show you um, in sites where you're willing to really kind of start over with a blank slate, uh, there are methods of site preparation including solarizing and smothering that are effective. Number six is garlic mustard. Now garlic mustard is a biennial species, so it's actually rather short lived. It was first recorded in the US on Long Island um, in 1868, likely introduced by settlers for food and medicinal use. It is a shade loving plant, rapidly colonizing the forest understory and it can displace spring wildflowers and specialist insects that depend on them. Garlic mustard changes the soil chemistry around where it grows and suppresses the growth of native tree seedlings. It's actually toxic to caterpillars of many of our native butterflies and deer can, insist, and can assist its invasion by avoiding, they don't like to eat the garlic mustard, but they'll eat all the native plants that are trying to grow nearby. The first year plants look like the ones up here in the inset. You get this rosette of heart-shaped um, crinkly leaves with um, toothed, coarsely toothed edges. In year two, the plants will throw up one or more flower spikes in the middle to late spring with um, small four-petaled flowers. And these will mature to form these elongated seed pods and that and the plant will um, uh, basically go dormant and drop its seeds by the beginning of summer in its second year. So the important thing to do is to manually remove small populations. You can easily pull all of the plants if it's only a small or emergent infestation. 
if it's a larger uh, patch, you can cut it to the ground and that will at least prevent it from flowering and going to seed. But recognize that some of the plants may re-sprout, so you'll have to return and do that at least a second year and maybe a third. Um, particularly if there is already a seed bank. This is another where the seeds are very persistent in the soil, can survive for many years. Um, and so even if you use herbicides to treat it, and I am not, I'm tending not to uh, emphasize the use of herbicides here because they can be more damaging to the environment as a whole and they will not kill seeds. So they will do nothing about the seed bank of existing um, invasive seeds. Number seven is autumn olive. Now this is a large woody shrub an East Asian species that was introduced in the 19th century and again, widely planted both as an ornamental for windbreaks or for erosion controls on highways before people realized how invasive it could become. It's a nitrogen fixer, although not a legume and was reused to and was used to replant deforested lands and thought to remediate areas with poor rocky soils because it would put nitrogen into those soils. However, in doing so, it does change the soil chemistry and that can also alter the native plant community around it. And once it um, matures and starts to spread, it again crowds out other plants. Um, it creates dense shade and previously open habitats and can prevent the normal ecological succession of an open field into a forest and um, dis disrupt the nutrient cycling. So more nitrogen is not always good. And um, the fact that it prevents tree, the, the native trees from growing up and becoming a uh, normal forest um, also harms the value of the habitat. So autumn olive flowers, um, Right about now, actually, in this part of Connecticut, it was flowering in May, and um, you will often smell it when it's flowering because it has a strong, sweet odor. Um, very abundant small flowers that then turn into these reddish succulent fruits, which are actually edible. And there are people who will gather these fruits and try to make jam or fruit leathers. And, you know, so that's a great way to help, help reduce uh, the seed dispersal is if we collect and, um, you know, cook them and then dispose of any um, seed properly. I mean, if it's thoroughly cooked, the seed is no longer viable. But again, you need to be careful about putting any um, um, berries that are not cooked into your compost because those seeds will still be able to sprout. The other identifying traits are these uh, kind of glossy uh, leaves with silvery undersides. Um, and there are the, the, the bark is this smooth sort of tan with the little um, dots or lenticels. There are sharp spines on the branches, not as frequent as rose, but that can make it quite um, uncomfortable to be uh, handling or removing autumn olive. And when the shrubs do get large, it, um, it's, it is like cutting trees. The wood is quite hard. Um, so it takes either like a forest mulcher to really go through a heavy um, thicket of um, autumn olive to cut it down. Um, smaller invasions can be hand cut um, and smaller younger plants can be pulled with weed wrenches or dug out, but it's quite labor intensive. Um, Autumn olive does look very, or there is another species called Russian olive that looks very similar and is also a non-native invasive. So one doesn't really have to worry too much about distinguishing the two unless you're interested in eating them because the Russian olive berries are uh, rather mealy and um, not sweet. So they're not nearly as um, um, appealing. So autumn olive is not eaten by insects or large herbivores. It's prolific fruit production, which is dispersed by birds and mammals that eat the berries are the way that it is spread. Um, so again, the best that one can do is try to 
manage it to by cutting it frequently to prevent the fruit production. And then also that frequent mowing or cutting will eventually deplete the roots of energy. As I said, this usually takes heavy machinery in large infestations like the one shown on this slide. Uh, the common reed, Phragmites australis, is sadly a fixture in our landscape. We see it all too often in our wetlands. Um, it is an introduced Eurasian subspecies that was, um, this one was probably not introduced deliberately, but came accidentally in ship ballasts in the late 17 or 1800s, and is now widespread across the country in pretty much all sunny wetlands and it tolerates both fresh and mildly brackish water. With its vigorous growth and dense rhizomatous root systems, it forms dense monocultures that crowd out or shade out native wetland species, degrading wildlife habitat and altering the wetland hydrology. It has little ecosystem function as few insects feed on it. It has tall tan stalks with bluish green leaves up to 15 feet tall um, before bushy flower plumes emerge in, during the summer. And the stalks and seed heads are usually seen persisting through the winter. There is a native Phragmites americanus. In fact, some think botanists feel it is a subspecies of the same species, but generally does not interbreed with Australis, the invasive. Um, we do not have many local populations of the native. Nevertheless, I will show you the distinguishing features. So the invasive, where the leaf joins the stem, has a very narrow band underneath that leaf sheath, um, whereas the native has a larger fuzzy band or ligule. Uh, the leaves of the invasive are longer and more bluish. And the, stem, the stems of the invasive, as I mentioned, are a dull tan throughout the growing season, whereas the native one, which is shown here, is shiny and reddish brown. So um, regarding control, um, Phragmites is also a very difficult to control invasive. Um, it is very, very difficult to eliminate, but can be managed by um, frequent cutting. And if one cuts multiple times in a year for at least a couple of years, it can be weakened to the point where the remaining regrowth can either be knocked out by very targeted um, herbicide application directly into the cut stems. This is something that should preferentially be done by trained individuals using only herbicides that are approved for use in wetlands. Um, but even if you don't use the herbicide, if you cut, if you cut continuously, it is possible to manage and restore um, a number of native plants, a native plant community to the wetland area. This is something that we are beginning to do at Coogan Farm um, and successes have been re reported elsewhere, but it's not a small undertaking. One that I'm thankful not to have had to deal with is the mile a minute vine. Like the Japanese knotweed, this is a member of the buckwheat family, although it is related more closely to vines like the native smart weeds, um, which, or, which are also called tear thumbs because they are vines with little prickles all along their stems that make them very uh, uncomfortable to handle without um, heavy garden gloves these little curved barbs. It has these um, very characteristic triangular leaves and these little round um, sheaths or collars around the stem, leaf-like um, collars around the stem at the nodes. So the native tear thumbs, which are, as I said, these are natives. They are perfectly good functioning native plants in their communities, although you may not want them in your garden, um, have leaves of different shapes. Either here is the halberd leaf tear thumb, polygonum aerifolium, and the arrow leaf tear thumb, polygonum sagittatum, two that you will find in um, natural environments and native plant communities here in Connecticut. But as I mentioned, the uh, mile a minute vine, which also resembles bindweeds in its habit. It grows, um, it's not twining, so it simply grows on top of other plants 
um, and smothers them because it can form a very dense cover. Um, and it has these little round collars and spiny stems. Also, if you look carefully, where the stem attaches to the leaf is actually in back of the leaf and not at the leaf edge. It makes um, lots of little flowers and clusters that turn into these blue fruits. And again, the blue fruits can be um, either dispersed by animals or they can drop off the vine and um, uh, float in the water um, or be moved around in the soil. Well, the plant usually grows as an annual, so that's kind of, and again, good news, bad news. It only lives for one year and it will die at the end of the growing season. But the fact that it can produce so many seeds, if it's allowed to go to seed, those seeds form a seed bank that will allow new populations to um, emerge the following year and in, in subsequent years that have to be um, um, controlled again and again. So the best thing to do is to try to affect control early in the season. Again, if you catch it when the infestation is um, early, um, you can try to pull as many plants as you can. Um, herbicides can be used to at least, you know, kill the plants off before they go to flower, but um, they usually need to be mis mixed with a surfactant or something to help them to penetrate a waxy coating on the mile a minute vine leaves. There are beneficial weevils that serve as biocontrol and, and have been released in Connecticut, but I think it's early days yet and it's not clear yet how effective this will be in the long term. And biocontrols are also not a golden bullet. What they attempt to do is try to restore some balance by creating a predator who will feed on the plants. And as long as there are plants that sustain the weevils, then the weevil populations um, will maintain themselves and you'll have um, an equal, a new equilibrium that ideally is shifted um, to allow the plants or to maintain the plants in a less vigorous state, but it will certainly not eliminate them. Nevertheless, this type of biocontrol approach has proven relatively effective and, plant, and invasive plants like purple loosestrife, which is not in the top 10, but still is present in Connecticut. It's, kind of, it's been knocked back pretty effectively by its biocontrols, whereas we now say it's an attractive nuisance and no longer as big a threat to our wetland plant communities. So there have been some successes. So we will hope that the biocontrol of mile a minute and some of our other invasives will prove to be um, successful long-term um, management strategies. Finally, I'll round out the top 10 uh, with black swallowwort. Uh, now this is a member of the milkweed family that comes from Europe. Unlike our native milkweeds, this one grows as a vine and you can see See here how it climbs on and twirl and, and, and twines around other plants. Um, it's not as long a vine as um, some others. It usually only grows maybe six to eight feet, but it can get up into small trees. Um, the flowers are these small, dark colored, star like, um, star shaped flowers that are blooming around, starting to bloom around now. They will mature to form these elongated tapered uh, pods that uh, are very reminiscent of actual milkweed pods. So um, one recognizes by this that they are milkweeds and these pods will turn brown and open, crack open to release fluffy seeds much like our native milkweeds. And that's again, the major um, uh, route of dispersal and how they can travel large distances. So swallowwort, again, with its vigorous growth habit, uh, can rapidly colonize an open field, form large patches, and eventually almost a monoculture that takes over the field. When it's young, you can see it emerge with these little dark green glossy pointed leaves. And if they're seedlings, this is the time to pull them. But even seedlings like the one shown here have, are already developing these fairly extensive root systems. And, um, a small bit of plant above the surface may be masking a very extensive um, 
and branched root system underground. So these are just things to bear in mind. Um, it is worth trying to um, dig out swallow warts. Pulling doesn't usually work because the stems will simply break and then the roots can re-sprout. Um, if you have a large infestation, cutting can be used as a management tool, but has to be done quite intensively, low to the ground and several times a season. And um, what I've observed is after repeated mowings, what the plants end up doing is they start flowering at earlier and earlier stages, low to the ground. So that's their way of adapting to evade um, our attempts at control. So it is, again, a, quite a difficult plant to control at um, URI. A um, moth has been developed whose caterpillars do feed very specifically on swallow warts and not our native milkweeds. So they have been deemed safe, safe for release. And those early release, releases are beginning in um, the United States and in Connecticut, but it's kind of too early to tell yet how successful this will be because the moth populations have not yet been able to establish themselves in uh, and over winter. Um, so there is still research and um, learning going on to understand where and how to uh, release moths in ways that they can be more effective in controlling the swallow wart. So here's a summary of a management calendar um, that basically takes all that information that I've presented to you and puts it on one page. For the top 10 plants, it shows you when they flower. It shows you different methods of control and when the best times are to use them across the growing season. So you can pick the methods that you are able to use or willing to use, whether chemical or non-chemical. And I just find it's a really good reference tool, especially if there are is more than one of these invasives in the areas you are trying to control. And this is on the SIPWIG website, as well as it'll be highlighted in the resources that I'm providing to Terry. Now, the one of the challenges of invasives is like many um, environmental problems, we um, humans as a, a society and a species tend not to pay much attention to invaders until they're really like in our face. So, and it's when it's early on, shortly after a plant, an invasive plant is introduced into an area that the, it's possible to eradicate or really effectively control them. As their invasion proceeds, they, they become more abundant and infest a larger area. Um, their rate of growth and spread actually increases and control costs uh, increase proportionately. And unfortunately, as this graph shows, public awareness usually doesn't begin till pretty far up on the curve where eradication has already become difficult, if not impossible, and very costly. And once we're up into the top of the curve here, the invader is well established in the environment, and the best one can do is local control. So we can, it's really a triage approach where you look at the environment and the most valuable habitats and you work to, to remove the invasive plant from those habitats and restore um, the native habitats there. So this may be in our nature preserves, in our um, land conserv in our conservancy lands, in um, parks or um, you know, in your own yards and gardens. I mean, these are places where we can take a small area and really put in that effort to get the invasive under control. So, and this, sum, this slide simply summarizes some of our general guidelines for long-term control, which are basically don't plant the invasives and encourage people to eliminate them where they're still be using, used as, alter, as, as ornamentals um, replace them with native alternatives that will provide so much better habitat for wildlife. Um, detecting them early, so learning how to recognize the plants in their seedling stages is best because uh, that's the time you can remove them and especially the bird dispersed species. You know, I continue to find barberry seedlings, bittersweet seedlings, multiflora rose in my yard and I have to pick out those seedlings every year. But if I do that um, while I'm weeding, 
then I don't get larger plants taking root and getting established. And that also prevents any of them from flowering and going to seed. Um, get to know the biology of the plant. Uh, read the descriptions about how they grow in, when they flower, and how they propagate to choose the best methods to control them. Use the management calendar and um, know when it is best to dig, cut, or mow. As I mentioned, there are cases where uh, attempts to dig plants out are, can be counterproductive because you're likely to leave root fragments or disturb the ground in ways that make it susceptible to greater invasion. Um, emphasize, persistence is important. There are no golden bullets, no one and done um, methods, I'm sad to say. Control right, requires ongoing effort but um, the good news that is that as you get an invasion under control, it gets easier. You can get the upper hand. And that small parcels that are protected or reclaimed and replanted with native plants not only provide additional wildlife habitat, but uh, make our ecosystem stronger and more resilient. You know, we can create wildlife corridors between our nat nat native um, um, protected um, and natural areas, we can um, create pollinator pathways. You know, these are all achievable goals and um, invasive control is one piece of that. So in addition to the methods I've talked about um, with respect to individual species, there are alternatives to pulling, digging and mowing. Um, if you have larger, uh, if you have areas that you want to um, basically devegetate completely and replant, um, either, either for meadow creation or creating a garden or any other type of um, more uh, valuable planting. And three methods that I'm going to talk about briefly here that um, I found to be effective are and are or organic and you know very easy on the environment are smothering, tarping, and solarization. They all invo involve covering the area to be remediated, but with different types of material and the way they work is slightly different. So there are nuances of differences of, as how to use each of these methods. So first, smothering. To do smothering, you have to first cut down the vegetation so it's very low to the ground. Uh, then you cover it with a thick layer, four inches more of organic material. This is your mulch. Um, to make it even more effective, you can put cardboard or paper, several layers of newspaper um, underneath the mulch. Um, if you're using cardboard, please remove plastic tape, etc., all the nasty stuff um, before you use it. But um, you can use brown cardboard, um, ram board, which is what they sell to builders to uh, protect um, the floors where they are working, or um, you can use any kind of um, you know, plain, plain brown paper uh, or um, newspapers underneath the mulch. And this can increase the effectiveness because what you're trying to do with smothering is to uh, prevent the weeds from reaching the surface and getting light to undergo photosynthesis. And this forces the plants to use up the energy that is stored in their roots, um, trying to grow. And if you leave the smother on for at least one grow, full growing season, this has been shown to be sufficient to suppress most perennial weeds. Um, the nice thing about smothering is you can work around plants that you want to preserve. So if there are trees or shrubs that you want to keep, but there are lots of invasives growing around them, this is a good technique. Uh, you can remove the smothering material for planting, but it's actually uh, more effective to leave it in place and let it um, degrade and decompose, um, which does take time. It may actually take a couple of years until it becomes a good enough substrate for planting. Or you can remove some of the um, mulch if it is something that's nutrient poor like wood chips and then supplement with a little bit of compost or leaves and then plant into that um, substrate instead. Or you can cut holes uh, specifically where you want to um, install a plant. 
Now, solarization starts out similarly by again mowing down the vegetation, but now you're going to cover the ground with clear plastic and then seal the edges of that plastic tightly around the edges of the site. Um, you're going to leave this plastic in place for weeks to months usually over the hottest time of the year because you're using that sunlight to um, create heat which gets trapped by the greenhouse effect between the plastic and the underlying ground and that heat buildup is what kills um, any weeds that try to grow and can even kill seed in the um, upper inches of the soil um, where Research studies have been done. It's been shown even in New England, in New Hampshire, um, that temperatures as high as 150 degrees can be achieved at the soil surface with temperatures of over 100 degrees, even at a depth of four inches. So um, this is enough to really do a good job at killing off that top layer of vegetation. Um, People worry that this actually sterilizes the soil and removes beneficial microbes, but when you plant, you're going to be replacing some of those microbes with the soil that is already around the plant roots. And in fact, um, if you're doing solar, solarizing is usually something that's done on smaller areas and around the edges, um, the, the microbes, the good microbes, bacteria and fungi can migrate back into the site from the edges. So this is not really proven to be an issue. After you remove the plastic, um, I recommend that you don't plant immediately, but wait a period of weeks to assess the effectiveness of the kill. You wanna see if anything's going to re-sprout and remove those residual weeds before you plant. Doing that can really save you a lot of work and headaches down the road. Uh, but then you can install your plants or spread seeds, however you wish to uh, recreate uh, your, establish your new um, gardens or habitat. So comparing these two methods, um, you can see that the materials used for cover are different. The mechanisms by which they work are different. Although I recommend, again, not trying to rush either method. Um, solarization heats the soil, um, to lethal temperatures and actually kills the vegetation that way, including, including plant roots in those upper layers of the soil. The smothering works exclusively by depriving the plants of light um, and that forces them to deplete the energy in their roots and weakens and eventually kills them in that manner. And it also, uh, the thick layer of mulch will suppress germination of seeds. Most, many of the weed seeds do not germinate unless they are close to the surface and can get a small amount of light or they cannot um, put up their, um, their young shoots and cotyledons very far. So if they're deep below the surface, they can't reach the surface. Um, the two methods uh, work in different sites, so only sites with full sun exposure that are generally fairly level um, are suitable for solarization, whereas smothering can be done in sun or shade, and as I mentioned, is also more easily done if you need to work around existing plants or other uh, landscape features, because we have, in our experience, even um, features like large rocks, um, if they are under the plastic, they provide a bit of protection around their edges to the plants growing there. And as I'll show you, it makes the solarization somewhat less effective. Um, smothering can actually be started any time of the year. Um, and it's functional when the plants are actively growing, but you can start a smother in the fall and leave it on over the winter and over the following spring and summer. But as I mentioned before, I would recommend not rushing it, let it uh, do its job for at least a year because it takes a fair amount of time to actually deplete the energy in the extensive root systems that many of the invasives have. Tarping, I haven't got a separate slide, um, but it's very similar to smothering, except you're using 
an opaque cover like a tarp, like a silage tarp, or a heavy thick piece of black plastic that you can subsequently remove, that you will subsequently remove before planting. But it works like, su sm like smothering in that it is preventing uh, the weeds underneath from receiving light or also because if it's impermeable um, water and in that way preventing them from growing and forcing them to use up their energy and even to dry out um, and in that way killing them. Uh, so it's, it's quite, it's like a variation of smothering. But if you don't have the mulch and you do happen to have a large heavy piece of black plastic um, or a silage tarp, you can use that type of um, method. So finally, um, I'd like to take the last uh, few minutes to, of my talk to show you how we've used solarized and smother solarization and smothering um, in a um, small project that I've been doing at Coogan Farm. Um, the site we're using is about 1,600 square feet. So I should have said when I talk about these methods as being uh, most applicable to management in small areas, small meanings kind of a half an acre, maybe an acre, and it's something as large as that you may want to do in several sections, not all at once. Um, the pre-existing vegetation at our site was a mix of pasture grasses, but it, in fact, it was mostly mugwort, swallowwort, with a helping of some woody invasives like porcelain berry, multiflora rose, and um, native green briar. Um, we tried to preserve um, a small patch of nadir deer tongue grass and milkweeds along an edge of this site. Uh, we did our site preparation treatments in 2018 through 2019, uh, did our assessment and planting in the fall of 2019. So we've now been able to see um, the results of the replanting in this in for one full season and 2021 is our second season. So a quick aerial view of the site and just to show you that on the left we covered with clear plastic uh, to solarize and on the right we smothered and this um, area has stone walls bordering it to the north and the east, so they were not um, a, a significant problem with respect to casting shadows. There was a large rock not shown here that was in our solarizing area close to one edge. There is a farm road to the south, um, so there was actually an area with very little vegetation to the south that acted as a bit of a buffer zone until um, uh, another uh, field began. So here's what our site looked like as we were preparing it. Uh, we had mowed everything down, uh, covered with the clear plastic. Um, we were loaned a piece of used greenhouse plastic and um, it wasn't large enough to do the whole site. So we were fortunate in having access to a lot of wood chip mulch. And I should mention, um, anybody can access to wood chip mulch if you're willing to work with your local landscaping companies, if you know a tree maintenance company or removal company, and you volunteer your site as a place to dump their wood chips, just work with them to make sure um, the the trees they are chipping don't have a lot of poison ivy on them or other things that you wouldn't want. But especially if they're mainly chipping upper, upper branches, um, that's very good material, very clean material to use as mulch. We laid down um, cardboard overlapping pieces and um, uh, put the mulch over them. And so this is showing you the work in progress. So this is obviously not completed. We also realized that August was too late to really do the solarization, but it sort of let us mark the area that we would be able to solarize. So what we ended up doing is taking up the plastic, putting it away for the winter, and then recovering the site in the spring to solarize over the subsequent spring and summer. So that was, um, the spring and summer of 2019. So we removed both the solarizing plastic and a lot of the wood chip mulch um, in late September. And this is what the site looked like underneath. So you can see in the mulched areas, there were some plants that grew up through the mulch. 
Uh, this is the area in front where we are trying to protect some milkweed. Here is the large stone that was actually under the solarizing plant stick. And you can see how barren the solarized site looked. But there, it turned out after we waited a couple weeks, we did see a few little bits of regrowth. It was mostly porcelain berry. And in particular, we saw porcelain berry trying to regrow around the edges of the large stone um, where it appeared to have gotten a little bit of protection by that uh, large rock. So I would, have, I would guess that there wasn't a lot of as much heat under the rock as on the rest of the soil. And so that allowed the porcelain berry there to survive. What survived in the smothered area, you saw much more vegetative growth. And when we were digging out those plants, we could see that these were much more established invasive um, porcelain berries. And you can see just how thick, big and thick those roots are. So even after the smothering, they were clearly not depleted and, you know, you know, obviously that's why they were able to regrow. We also saw some swallowwort come up. And when we dug them out carefully, we found these extensive root systems. So the smothering was clearly not working as well for the types of invasives that have these very thick and extensive root systems. But mugwort, which is shallower, even though it has rhizomatous roots, they are shallow. And they seem to have been, um, um, controlled very well by both methods. So we did put in the work to dig out all the green that we could see and then planted a whole bunch of plugs which are now marked by the little flags. In addition, we, um, after pl planting the plugs in um, late October, we broadcast some seed for a cover crop and early, a mix of early season grasses, annual grasses, and um, fast growing forbs, and then covered that lightly with um, weed free chopped straw, sort of walked all over it to try to press the seed into the soil. You can also use a little lawn roller, but we didn't happen to have one and our, and our site was not completely flat. So we did our best by just walking back and forth over it several times um, to um, press down the, the seed in the straw and then hope that the snows would come and further do the work over the winter. And this is how we left it in November. By the following spring, uh, that cover crop had come up. The milkweeds we had preserved, in fact, just did reemerge. Uh, we saw a few weeds, but it wasn't too bad, all things considered. And eventually we did see some of our plug planted species grow and flower. Here's some um, hairy beard tongue and rudbeckias. And later in the season, we also saw mountain mints, gold, uh, goldenrods and asters. So we were very encouraged. We did have to make a couple of passes over the course of the season. If you have good eyes, you'll see there's a little bit of mugwort here. And so here and there, we did find some weeds. But um, all in all, it was a rather encouraging start to our meadow. So in summary, what we learned with our Coogan Farm project is that thorough invasive removal before planting is an important investment in, in successful restoration and that you can effectively get control of these herbaceous invasives, even when there's surrounding weed pressure. And I should say on other parts of the farm, there are still high levels of invasives of many different species. And so, you know, there is a, going to be a continuing threat of seeds coming in, even if we are vigilant about removing any residual plants. Um, both the smothering and solarization worked well for us in this instance, um, controlling the mugwheat, mugwort very well and the smothering to a lesser extent, but um, it had partial effectiveness on um, uh, multiflora rose and um, porcelain berry and swallowwort. Uh, the importance of, of not uh, rushing to plant as soon as you remove the covers was emphasized by our experience seeing um, some weeds grow back in about a month in the fall after we removed the covers. Um, 
and taking the time to manually remove those, I think has really lessened the amount of work we are now needing to put in to continue control. And um, we are heartened that we will be able to do this with relatively low maintenance, but low maintenance is not no maintenance. Um, and the weeds are still returning from surrounding areas. So we are um, keeping an eye on things in uh, 2021, and, um, but hoping to see more of our perennial species mature and um, start to flower and produce seed of their own. So, um, That's really um, the advice I have to say, and that um, if you are revegetating, um, it helps to start with plants. You really get quite a head start because if you expect some weeds to come back, it'll really give you plants you can recognize quickly. And then the cover crop helps by filling in those empty places that the weeds like to um, germinate in. So, this briefly is a list of the resources, which Terry is also going to provide to you in an email, so you have, don't have to worry about um, copying them down. But the SIPWIG web, website is really a treasure trove. It has the in Connecticut invasive plant list, a management calendar, and a lot of those pictures I showed you are from a photo notebook that they have created. Um, there is also a concise invasive plants in your backyard notebook guide that was put out by the Connecticut River Coastal Conservation District and updated as recently as 2020. Um, there are loads of handouts on the SIPWIC website from their latest symposium. And um, both Kathy Connolly and I talked about our experiences with solarization and smothering at the symposium and have provided some resource notes um, that are available on that site. Um, and there are a couple of other good um, publications that I'm providing, which will tell you more about good native alternatives you can use. And I, in, in closing, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group. This is a dedicated and, and really terrific group of experts and volunteers. Um, and you can be a part of it or you can help support them by reporting um, native plants. I didn't talk too much about that, but on the website, it tells you about mobile apps you can download to your smartphone. You can take pictures and then um, upload them um, to iNaturalist or uh, different um, websites that will help document these. And SIPWIG can then use that information to guide their um, Monitor surveillance and management recommendations. Um, I would like to acknowledge, of course, the volunteers who helped me with the Coogan Farm project and some funding we obtained from Honeys, a company that had a Gardens for Bees, Gardens for Bees grant program. And here's my contact information. Um, I think we have some time for questions. And um, we do. I was just actually looking in the chat and the Q and A. We've got a lot of questions. Okay. Um, so one question that's actually jumping out at me is, what do you recommend that we do with plants that have uh, that we've cut or have removed? Do you put them in the trash? Do you burn them? What do you do with them? Um, it depends on the, the type of plant. If they are plants that are able to reroot and propagate from those fragment like root fragments. So this is things like knotweed. Um, Multiflora rose. Um, it it depends, but what you can do is if you if there are small amounts and it's feasible to bag them in large like um, garbage bags and take them off the site, you can let them die or decompose in the bags and then de dispose of them. Um, you can lay them out on in a pile on a large tarp, anything that protects them from rerooting in the guard and the ground and let them again dry out and die that way. Once they're dead, they are safe to just dispose of. Um, you know, if you have permits to burn them safely, you know, and the the you know ability to do that, that is a possible alternative. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear the question because you, yes, you do need to be thoughtful about how you remove them. Um, 
in particular, if you can cut off the parts with the seeds and specifically bag them so those seeds can't be spread, that's probably the most important thing. But that's why control is often recommended to be done before the plants set their seed, because that'll save you the headache. Oh, great, thank you. So someone, a couple of people had questions about the herbicides. Uh, one woman wanted to know, Teresa wanted to know, can you use an herbicide on bittersweet? And then someone else wanted to know why um, you do that in the fall. Okay, so the answer to the first question is yes, I believe um, you can use herbicides on bittersweet. And if you consult both the SIPWIG website or um, I think that booklet I recommended from the Conservation District, they will tell you which herbicides work best. Usually glyphosate is quite effective. And, um, you know, personally, I think if you use it in a very restricted and targeted manner, you can do so safely and effectively. Um, and part of that is the timing. So glyphosate if you put it directly on the plant you want to kill, so you like the cut and paint methods, if you cut a stem and paint it on, um, it will get transported in the late part of the season, and this usually means like late July and onward, it'll get transported better into the plant roots, because at that stage of the life cycle, the plant has finished most of its growing, it's putting its energy into flowers and seeds, but also into the, the photosynthesis it's doing is bringing nutrients that it's going to store up in its roots for the next growing season. So by treating at this time, you prevent that from happening and you also get more of the herbicide into the plant roots where it can be effective. Uh, so great, thank you. <laughs> Someone also had a question on lesser uh, selenine? I'm not sorry, I'm pronouncing it. Okay, know. yes, that is another of the invasives. It wasn't in the top 10, but this is one that does, again, threaten our native spring ephemerals, and it tends to grow in wetland places. It looks a lot like um, the native marsh marigold, which is very pretty, and even the lesser selenine, if, if you're, you know, if you don't know what it looks like, you might see and say, oh, isn't that a pretty wildflower? Um, it's best to try to just pull it. It's pretty easy to pull because um, the areas where it grows, it's are really pretty moist and it's a fast, it's a pretty fast grower in the springtime. I can't remember if it's actually ephemeral or not, but I know um, at the Nature Center, a patch was discovered this year and we were able to pull it all out, um, you know, quite effic efficiently. And actually sort of along that line, I know it wasn't on the top 10 list either, but can you talk a little bit about bindweed and how to control that? Um, yeah, um, I guess I would probably control, try controlling it similar to the way you treat mile a minute, like anything, preventing it from going to fruit and flower. If you want to prevent the damage it causes by twining up all your other, tangling up all your other plants, cut it near the base try to get out the root if possible, because if you don't, it will re-sprout. But if it's like in your garden and you can't get out the root, all the root, you'll just have to, you know, keep an eye on it and probably cut it more than once. Right. And so actually, uh, someone else had another question. I'm sorry, I can't see the name about uh, glyphosate. Um, asking, when you, when you say use it in a targeted method, do you mean paint on the leaves, on the stem or the roots? And I just also want to say, you know, Doug, we had Doug Tallamy, who's obviously, if anyone's into native gardening, we had him do a webinar in January, and he actually also talked about this very targeted use of this herbicide on um, invasives. And it's m probably more for your established invasives that are really large, where you're just not going to be able to pull them all out. Um, and also large areas of, uh, of land where you've got invasives. So if you've got, if you're working on five to 10 acres, you know, or, or more, you know, it, it might be that this is what people are talking about. But again, can you just identify the targeted method? I've seen it done and it, it is very targeted. <laughs> yes, and Terry, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, in, in those larger areas, you're probably gonna be calling on a professional to do it anyway. And it's almost, you know, kind of, it is, it is sort of the, the, the method of last resort, 
but sometimes it can be more effective. And I think what Doug Tellamy is talking about is also if you use it very thoughtfully as part of an integrated control program, that means you've probably already cut mode, used mechanical methods first. And those are usually good at knocking back a small infestation to, you know, you, it's like about 90%, 95% effective. And then you're only using the herbicide to sort of mop up those last few really stubborn or really established plants that are not diggable, not cuttable. Or like autumn olive, if you're able to cut, you know, let it regrow, cut it again, do that a couple of times, and then maybe late in the season, again, picking that time of year when it's most effective. You do that last cut late in the season, paint the stems in the fall, and you're gonna really knock that back. I, I won't say you'll necessarily kill it, but you'll have a much better chance. You'll, you'll have much more severely weakened the plant and maybe you will have killed it. Um, so, so that, and that way you use much less. So you're not introducing as much into the environment. Right, exactly. So um, Jean also wanted to know, will the heat of solarization affect shrub and tree roots under the area? Yeah, I worry about that. And that's why I was saying smothering is probably your better choice. I wouldn't want to put that clear plastic directly on tree roots, especially if it's a type of tree or shrub that has a fairly shallow root system, because it is going to hurt them. Um, it may not kill them, but it's, it's certainly not going to be healthy for that tree to experience those kinds of temperatures for an entire growing season. Um, and it may also restrict the amount of water that can get to the tree because that plastic is not permeable. It may trap some moisture underneath that initially helps with the kill because what you get are like some seeds trying to germinate and then they literally get steamed to death. So or boiled alive. But, um, but yeah, I would be a little bit leery of trying to solarize really close to trees, trees and shrubs you want to save. So Barbara wants to know, she said, I want to, I want to sol solarize or uh, smother a pretty large, pretty big um, patch of mugwort. Do I need to be concerned that the plants will send its rhizomes to the outer areas around the patch? Um, well, let's put it this way. The edge is a lot smaller area to be managing than the middle, you know, than the patch you're covering, I would assume. So we do, you know, we do see that. So the area that we are working on on Coogan Farm, we called phase one and contingent on the success there at which we now feel we've achieved, we are trying to repeat ourselves by taking an adjacent site and solarizing that. So there is, you know, there is mugwort and there's other invasives on that adjacent site. Um, so yes, I would expect that if there are some roots that aren't totally under the plastic, part of that plant could survive and could send up sprouts outside your solarized area. But as I said, you've reduced your problem a lot. Mm -hmm. None of these is going to be like 100%, but you know, it, it is a way of getting a handle on things and really getting on top of a much larger area than you could possibly cut or dig or you know, controlling it by another method. And if you don't want to use chemicals particularly. Right, right, exactly. And actually to that point, Alice um, wanted to know when there are multiple invasives in a site, how do you judge which techniques to use? Well, um, so it, again, depends on your approach. So the solarizing and smothering is pretty good except for the really big woodies as I said, the porcelain berry with those huge roots, and I imagine autumn olive um, plants with really, really huge root systems um, probably wouldn't be killed. They'd be slightly weakened, but wouldn't be killed by either the solarization or smothering unless you were willing to kind of reapply the cover for you know many years and really leave that site fallow for many years. Um, so I think for the woody, um, shrubs, you're going to have to choose the methods that are most appropriate for them, which probably involve cutting them at least once or twice uh, to weaken them. And if you're willing to do the paint and daub method, uh, the cut and paint method, using that toward the end of the season. Um, but you do read up on the methods that are appropriate for each species. So you may have to prioritize and um, even like get rid of maybe the herbaceous stuff first, then tackle the woodies. Um, 
you know, I'm facing that problem in one of our sites, which has some Japanese knotweed, but it also has other evasives. So I'm a little concerned that as we are getting the knotweed under control and it's not shading out everything else, well, the multiflora rose and the uh, um, autumn olive is just moving in and wine, wine berries. So we're gonna have to be more thoughtful about, you know, either replanting more quickly or just being much more aggressive about tackling all those species at once, which is a challenge, I have to say. And you just mentioned um, porcelain berry, and so Mark actually had said also, dot, 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 how about porcelain berry? Any yeah. advice on that? Um, so yeah, so we've had some experience with porcelain berry because it's actually one of our major advances at Coogan Farm. And um, so I have to say, based on what we've seen, the smothering and the solarizing, so the solarizing worked better because I think those big roots are shallow enough that even though they're very thick, they were more susceptible to heat damage. And um, we were getting very little uh, porcelain berry regrowth in our solarized area. So that was encouraging. And I put that forward cautiously because our experience is limited. Um, you can cut back porcelain berry. Um, you may have to time cuts try to do it, um, it, it's, it doesn't emerge till, I think I was seeing it emerge either in late April. Um, so it wasn't one of the first ones to emerge. So you can let it grow up a little, you know, let it grow up a fair bit before you cut it because what you're trying to do is deplete energy. And if you cut too early, it's sort of a waste of effort. <laughs> um, so it's, it's something you'll have to judge for yourself as what amount of growth it's still convenient for you to cut, but try to track the vines back as far as close to the roots as possible when you cut, because otherwise they will simply branch and continue to grow. And then recognize you will probably have to do at least two cuts per season. But if you do that, you should be able to weaken it and ideally prevent the flowering and fruiting. And I think for an extensive infestation, those are your first goals. You know, don't let it flower and fruit anymore and start to weaken the plants. And once they're weak, and if you start being able to find those big um, root masses, maybe even mark them with a flag so that you can come back and recut them uh, more efficiently. Um, and if you do that, and eventually, and if you're willing to do cut and paint toward the end of the season, that should, I think, give you the most effective strategy for control. So again, combining more than one method and using the right timing, preventing fruiting, fruiting and flowering, and you know, recognizing and learn to recognize the seedlings because if it's been around for a while, you will have lots of seedlings. Right, for sure. I know. I, I think out of your top ten, I have eight in my yard. So. Um, uh, I have two questions that are actually kind of similar. So one, the first is when trying to manage common reed, what are the native alternatives to Phragmites? And then a sort of similar question is, what are some good replacement plants for under tree canopies? So basically, what, you know, what are our native alternatives once we're done trying to get rid of getting rid of these invasives? Okay, I mean, that's such a broad I know, I know. It's like okay. almost another webinar. So the second question is, I'm simply going to refer you to the resources. Okay. Because I think in some cases, um, they actually list, I mean, in the case of trying to get rid of an invasive plant that you're using as an ornamental, if you want something that has a similar form or similar fe features, um, ornamental features, there might be specific choices. Jessica Lubell at UConn has actually done a fair bit of work on this for native shrubs, native shrub alternatives. Um, for the forest understory, um, that's a broader question. And um, I think it's hard to get more specific without knowing, knowing more about the specific site in question, how large it is and what we're talking about, if it is a more wild site or if it is on somebody's property or on a public, you know, a woodland edge that abuts like public property of some sort. Um, well, but meaning like um, a schoolyard or, you know, church property or something like that. Um, but if you look at the lists of um, native alternatives, I think you will see both those that are available commercially and that are highly recommended, you know, 
you, and they are kind of grouped by their growth forms, whether they're shrubs or herbaceous or spring ephemerals, um, you know. So, but that's that's a lot of what we do at Wild Ones is we teach people what these native plants are and how to grow them. So if you're really interested in doing that yourself, you know, come to Wild Ones programs or come join our group. I have to say, yes, the Wild Ones programs are great. Uh, the speakers are excellent. Liddy does an awesome job pulling those together. So you will learn a lot. Um, let me see if there are any other questions. We're pretty, we're a little bit over our time, uh, but I just want to see if there's anything else. Um, <laughs> are any of these protocols good for forest understory, like the the smothering and obviously not solarization probably, but um so i it yeah in, in my opinion i think you could do a smother um so if you have an area that's been heavily overtaken by an invasive um particularly an herbaceous one right. you could try you could certainly try the smother so like maybe garlic mustard i don't personally know of instances where people have tried that yet and at least here in Southern Connecticut, this has been a problem that's been growing in the last, just the last couple of years where I've seen more and more garlic mustard. But um, one could try the smothering because you can work, it lets you work around the trees and it doesn't hurt them. And, you know, after a couple of years, you could start introducing as that smothering material, particularly if it's wood-based or leaf-based, as it breaks down, you can start replanting with the native spring ephemerals or other, you know, shade tolerant native species like, um, you know, blue stem goldenrod or, you know, depending on how wet or dry the site is. And you'll find some of those, in some of those cases, if there is, um, you know, you'll get, um, I think Lydia froze up in our Zoom. Well, let me see if there are any other questions. Hopefully we'll, we'll get Lydia unfrozen in a second. Um, Mike from New England Pollinator Gardens has said, just sort of dropping advice in the chat, which is helpful. He said, just a note for large scale, scale barberry removal, we deploy propane blow torching especially effective in early spring, we do not use any chemicals for invasive removal. Um, that's actually a first time I've heard that, but uh, that, oh, I think I just lost Lydia. Oh, that's, that's so sad. Um, and then he had also mentioned that agricultural grade vinegar of 20% acidity uh, was also effective, but you need to wear masks, gloves, and an eyewear, eye protection. So, well, I will take that as my hint. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I hope this was helpful. I will try to get this up on our YouTube channel ASAP. Sometimes it's really more about YouTube cooperating with my computer than anything else. And also thank you for um, your patience with Zoom. Zoom can also be a little bit wonky. And so um, I just, if you had any trouble, I hope that you were able to figure, you know, get, get on and watch it. And that's also why we have the YouTube channel so people can watch it later. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night.